uh, first of all, I would like to uh, now introduce to you our uh, today's first panelist. Uh, I will introduce him in Polish, but uh, his presentation will be in English. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We have our translators, so everything works as it should. Um, Dr. Habilitowany Krzysztof Wasilewski, Professor uh, Politechniki Koszalińskiej, jest politologiem i medioznawcą. Jest uh, również prorektorem do spraw kształcenia uh, Politechniki Koszalińskiej i kierownikiem Katedry Studiów Regionalnych i Europejskich Wydziału Humanistycznego tejże uczelni. Był stypendystą między innymi John Fitzgerald Kennedy Institute for North American Studies Wolnego Uniwersytetu Berlina, Freie Universität Berlin, Cambridge University, University of Michigan and Arbor w Stanach Zjednoczonych oraz Narodowego Centrum Nauki w Polsce. Jego zainteresowania naukowe dotyczą między innymi analizy dyskursów medialnych, polityki pamięci, tożsamości pogranicznej i teorii krytycznej. Jest autorem trzech monografii, w tym e, godne e, uwagi e, tutaj e, bezdomnych gromady niemałe, dyskurs imigracyjny na łamach prasy amerykańskiej e, między 1875 a 1924 rokiem i również autorem e, 50 artykułów naukowych e, opublikowanych w czasopismach e, krajowych i zagranicznych. E, panie profesorze, e, jeżeli pan jest gotowy, pan nas słyszy? Tak, słyszę. I My widzimy, gotowy. słyszymy pana wspaniale. Ma pan możliwość e, tak zwanego szerowania, tak? Tylko poprosiłbym, jak Pan już później kończy swoją prezentację i swój udział, żeby kliknąć na skąd, zakończ szerowanie, żeby następny mógł się włączyć swoim, swoją prezentację. Uh, ok, profesor Wasilewski, uh, the floor is yours, so you have up to 30 minutes for the presentation, and then discussion will uh, be the next part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a warm introduction. Uh, now it's really difficult to say anything better than what you have already said. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for this conference and for letting me take part in this conference. It's a real privilege and I'm really glad and happy that I can be here with you, especially that Szczecin University is my alma mater and Institute of History and International Relations is the one that I graduated from uh, quite a few years ago. So it's really, uh, it's a pleasure to, to and uh, something that is stressing that I can speak now in front of uh, people who were my teachers uh, a few years ago. So I hope I won't make any mistake and uh, my, my speech will be quite uh, logic. Uh, I don't have any presentation because my, uh, my speech will be rather theoretical than empirical. Uh, and I allowed myself to divide it into three parts. The first part will be uh, the definition of the borderlands, because as we all know, this term has become a very broad term that can mean pretty much everything now. Uh, so it is wise and uh, should be introduced here what I understand by saying borderlands, borders and frontiers. Uh, because, as I just said, uh, this term can mean everything depending on uh, scholar disciplines or scholars as such. Uh, so I let myself to, to, to de devote the first part of my speech to the definition of the borderlands. The, the, the second part will be uh, the introduction to politics of fear as a political category. Uh, and the category that you, is used to define uh, borderlands and border relations, how it become um, used by politicians and how uh, it differs from, uh, from traditional propaganda. And finally, the third part will be uh, these case studies of two, uh, two 
historical events from from Polish history in the 20th century. Uh, the first will be uh, the 1920 East Prussian plebiscite in uh, East Prussia, uh, or Plebiscyt na Warmii Mazura i Powiślu, as it is known in Polish. Uh, in German, it would be Volksabstimmung in Ostpreußen, forgive me my German. And the second uh, example will be uh, the recovered territories, that is the, the borderland that became to existence in 1945. So uh, I hope our 30 minutes will be enough. Uh, I will check, I have 25 minutes. I think uh, I will be able to, 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 to manage within that time. So uh, as I said, borderland, borderlands, frontiers, can mean pretty much everything now. Uh, a historian from the University of Utah, Bradley J. Park, says that nearly all parts of the world were at some point in their history in some way connected to or defined by a frontier. Uh, since the linguistic turn in the 1980s, many scholars and many disciplines have adapted the word borderland to their own uh, interest. So um, borderland is used not only in historical terms or political terms, but now borderlands can appear in literary studies, culture studies, uh, and even in the technological studies where, where scholars uh, research on the borderland between human and, uh, and techno uh, what is human and what is technology. So uh, we need to first say what we mean by the borderland since the, the, the very conference is uh, devoted to that, uh, to that topic. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary says that boundary uh, is that which serves to indicate the bounds or limits of anything. So it's quite a broad definition that doesn't very much say anything about borders. We can say, as uh, some scholars maintain, that boundaries are unspecific divides or separators that indicate limits of various kinds. So this, this definition brings us closer to what uh, borderlands, borders, frontiers can mean in, uh, in this specific context that we have been talking about since yesterday. Uh, some scholars maintain and say that modern nature of borders uh, specifically locate them in, uh, in the context of nation states, because the nation states are the only power that can construct or deconstruct uh, modern borders. These borders meant as div divisions between uh, nation states and between uh, societies that live in this uh, in these uh, states. However, uh, I am a great fan of uh, post-colonial theory and I try to locate my research in that uh, research uh, context. And uh, post-colonization says that uh, borderlands are those territories that are far from power, from the centers of power. In other words, borderlands are those places where uh, people uh, struggle, where their voices are silent, silenced and covered, where memories are broken and destroyed, as one scholar said. So uh, from this perspective, we should look at borderland, but not only borderlands, but borderland regions as such, uh, as uh, regions, uh, as periphery, as political, economical and cultural peripheries where, um, uh, where there's this struggle between uh, what is local, what is uh, regional and what is, uh, what is coming from the political and cultural and economical center that actually says, sets the, 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 the borders in, uh, and divides in territories into peripheries and uh, centuries. So post-colonization and post-colonial studies give us this interesting perspective to look at borderlands, not only from the perspective of political or, or historical processes, that is uh, how borders changed, how territories became parts of this or that country or, or this or that state, but it allows us to, to look at this territory and people who live there 
as an independent uh, as an independent uh, identity uh, which should be researched on and which is quite different from from the rest of the for example nation states uh, even though it is still a part of this uh, nation uh, state so uh, we can say we can we see that border research is uh, is a multilingual endeavor when when where uh, vocabularies, uh, where languages, where different academic perspectives are mixed and 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 often confused. So uh, to sum up this this part uh, on the borderlands, we can agree, or I would like to 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 to, to tell you how I understand borderlands because. Uh, from the definitions that I have given and from the perspectives that I have provided so far, um, uh, we can say that the borderland is not just a region that lies object to a border. Uh, this is the definition provided in 1994 by Oscar Martinez, but we can say that borderlands are not just physically uh, physical lines that divide one nation from another, but are a political construct uh, that pertains uh, not only political relations, but also other relations that uh, that take place uh, between uh, on every level of social relations from up to bottom, uh, we can say. So I would like you to, to, to look at borderlands uh, from this broad perspective, including uh, geographical uh, features of borderlands, but first and foremost, this uh, constructive uh, elements of the borderlands that that seems to be, uh, if, if not the most important, then especially important in relation to to what we have been talking about uh, during this uh, conference. So, if uh, if borderlands are a social construct or political construct, then uh, one of the categories through which we can construct borderlands is, in my opinion, and this is the main thesis of this uh, speech, that is the that borderlands can be defined by the category of fear. Uh, and here I would like to introduce the concept, the politics of fear, which is a new, it's not a new concept. It has been in political stu political science studies and history studies for quite a quite a few years now. But it became, it has become especially important since uh, 2001, when uh, when the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center on uh, September 11 provoked uh, the American government to act uh, to wage a war against terrorism, as it was called. And this war, as we probably all know, was uh, rest. The, 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 the idea of this war rested on the idea of politics of fear. So the, the government, the American government used fear uh, and the power of fear among uh, not only Americans, but actually uh, among societies, the whole world to to excuse their uh, their actions and their wars that they waged after the September 11, 2001. So the, this case studies of the terrorist attacks and what happened next that is, uh, American wars with, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the entire uh, fee, the, 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 the entire idea of fear that um, pervaded the whole world. Actually, it shows what fear, how what what potential fear has in modern political relations, in modern political actions. So, but having said that, we must remember that politicians uh, have always used fear to to manipulate people to 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 realize their goals and uh, and um, to to make people believe what they want to believe. So, even uh, Thomas Hobbes, in his uh, famous work, said that uh, fear uh, leaves strong marks on public debates and policy making. So he's, Thomas Hobbes said that fear is one of those categories, political categories that, uh, when uh, were uh, employed, they uh, may play a significant role in setting uh, domestic relations and also uh, international relations. Uh, and that that he was right. We could see after the September the 11th uh, attacks. 
uh, and, uh, and and what fear uh, made uh, governments, politicians, and societies do. Mm, uh, having said that, we must remember that the politics of fear is not uh, synonymous with the propaganda. Of course, uh, the propaganda includes politics of fear when necessary, but politics of fear is something stronger. It's a political category as I say, uh, it's not all, it does not only uh, exist in the discursive uh, sense, just like propaganda, because propaganda is uh, disseminated by the mass media. Without, without media, propaganda uh, cannot achieve its goals. But policy of fear is something more than propaganda, because it's not just uh, a discursive uh, communication that creates fear among public, but it also provokes certain actions from uh, politicians who, just like the rest of the society, also you uh, allow fear to lead their actions and to lead their decisions that make. So these two categories, that is, uh, that these two ideas that borderlands are uh, political construct and uh, that politics of fear is one of the main categories uh, that can be employed to construct the borderlands. Uh, I would like you to now look at these two uh, case studies that um, I would like to introduce. So uh, the first uh, first is uh, the 1920 is Prussian plebiscite in plebiscite na warmi Mazurach i Powiślu, and the second is um, the, the recovered territories that is the construction of Polish, the Polish German, uh, the Polish German uh, borderland in 1945. So um, please uh, take a look at these two examples, uh, keeping in mind that politics of fear uh, includes messages about fear that are repetitious, stereotypical, and of outside threats uh, of evil others, um, just like the United States wage a war against axis of evil, that is uh, politics of fear in the modern contemporary uh, uh, situation. But in the past, these two, these two uh, case studies, politicians used politics of fear to, to show uh, the evil others and th simply those who lived on the other side of the um, erected uh, border. So, so uh, going back uh, for a second to fear and the politics of fear, we can say that uh, that fear uh, perverts cri crisis in normal times. The politics of fear is used not only in crisis, just as I, I will be talking about these two examples, but it uh, also is used later, uh, further on. Mm, so, uh, going uh, so starting with the uh, East Prussian plebiscite. Uh, I guess we we all know the details about um, this event, so there's no point in going back to to setting the historical context to, to it. I would like to uh, uh, to concentrate on the politics of fear from the German uh, side, actually, and uh, because uh, it was the German propaganda, the German political actions that. Uh, could be used as a symbol of politics of fear and how the construction of borderlands took place then. Uh, so when you take a look at, uh, at what uh, German uh, newspapers wrote at the time, for, for example, in Alstein on Allenstein, uh, just such titles as uh, Allensteiner Volksblatt or Allensteiner Zeitung, uh, you can see that uh, what the, the, the picture of Poles, the picture of Poland concentrated on on fear that uh, could on the on the fear that um, that uh, Germans should Germans and the Mazura people should feel uh, against Poles because Poles were depicted as bloodthirsty uh, people who wage wars who are not only um, poor but also who does do not know how to govern their own uh, state so. Uh, we can see that fear did not only uh, refer to this stereotypical fear that is fear, fear, fear of others, fear of something we don't know, but it also was used as fear, economical fear and cultural fear and religious fear because 
the notion that Poles were Catholics uh, was omnipresent in uh, the German political actions during the plebiscite to, 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 to provoke this religious fear among Protestants and others that once Poles will come and once uh, the Warmian Mazuri will become uh, Polish, uh, Catholicism will become the, the the state religion, and the other denominations will not be able would not be able to 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 exist. So uh, this shows this propaganda present in uh, in uh, local newspapers, but also present in uh, local actions when German authorities were. Uh, were using people to 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 stage fights on the streets uh, to 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 show that 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 the, the poles are brutal and they that they use power force this physical force to 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 get what they want what to get what they wanted created uh, the idea of fear among uh, German people and often among the Masura people so it shows how this politics of fear constructed. Uh, borderlands constructed divisions long before these borderlands were set by political uh, decisions or by political treaties. So, so we can see that the politics of uh, fear uh, is often employed long before political actions, these official political actions uh, take place and before uh, treaties are signed that divide certain territories into, uh, in, into one nation or another. But politics of fear it does not follow, but often precedes these political actions, and and it's necessary to construct borderland uh, because borderland, in its very nature, needs uh, divisions. It needs to to set clear categories through which we can uh, we can evaluate people and through which we can divide people into uh, certain categories. For example, ethnic ethnic categories, because in, in this region, the, 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 there was no natural borderlands. The, the borderlands need to be created politically, socially, culturally. So this is why politics of fear played such an, an extensive role in setting, uh, in constructing Polish-German borderland in the, in the 1920s. Uh, and the same we can say about the 1945 and the, the creation, the construction of the borderland, uh, the Polish-German borderland after World War II. When the the concept of the recovered territories were uh, was introduced, and as historians say, the the, the Polish state uh, used uh, all embracing propaganda, as uh, we can read in in, in material in documents from that time. This all embracing propaganda uh, rested uh, relied on the idea of fear that was to create fear among Poles to, to, to not only accept the, the new territories of Poland because uh, the Western territories were uh, given to Poland uh, while the, the Eastern uh, frontiers were lost to the Soviet Union. So the fear uh, was, the politics of fear was used to not only Make, people, make Polish people accept the new frontiers, but also to make sure that, that these frontiers will be guarded and governed by Poles and the Polish uh, nation. So uh, in th th this politics of fear in 1945 and the following years relied on four arguments, historical, geopolitical, economic, and moral arguments. And these four arguments, these four categories of arguments were used they all were used, but they all relied on the idea of fear because uh, as well, if you uh, go through Polish newspapers, through Polish movies, through Polish art of that time, you will see that what, what picture was the most uh, omnipresent in the propaganda and the actions of politicians was, was this picture of a bloodthirsty German, just like in 1920, it was a bloodthirsty Pole. 1945 it was uh, bloodthirsty Germans who wanted to regain their, their, their territories and this is why Poles need to defend them uh, by force if uh, necessary. So th th this omnipresent propaganda, this all embracing propaganda as the, gov the Polish communist government uh, said at that time, 
was to uh, induce fear into Poli Poles who, who lived in the Western territories, who moved to the Western territories, to make sure that they, the, the fear would not allow them to, 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 to uh, have any other political ideas except for the, for the domination one. And this uh, shows how this post-colonial perspective, uh, this division into peripheries and into political centers is, is visible in, in this example because uh, it was the, 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 the power center uh, the, that decided about uh, relations, social relations, cultural relations in the borderland uh, in um, post-war uh, Poland. So uh, if you look into what was said, what was written about Polish-German relations, it was uh, the fear is this idea that it's visible at once. For example, in one of the in one of uh, newspapers, uh, not just those newspapers controlled by the communist regime, because uh, at that time not all newspapers were strictly controlled by the communist regime, but the, the, all other newspapers, even those that remained uh, a bit uh, independent from the from the government, even there you can, you can meet uh, you can find this uh, this uh, politics of fear. For example, in one of the newspapers uh, it said that from the german side all that poles have had have met uh, this uh, quote uh, throughout all the centuries and years was the, the 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 need to to exterminate of our nation and exterminate uh, not just physically but also culturally and politically so this is this was this idea of extermination that Poles uh, could ex could expect from the German nation during the war and after the war. This was the main uh, idea that uh, politics of fear was uh, built around, and it was uh, this was the main idea that decided about relations in in uh, in uh, in Polish uh, in Poland in 1945 and the first following years. So uh, we can see that politics of fear served the Polish government to, to build this uh, picture of the Polish guard, the Polish watch uh, against the German invasion into central, not only into Poland, but into central Europe that, that could be expected. So the Pol Poles who lived in the borderlands where this Polish watch was, this, were these Polish guards who were uh, to guard the entire nation against Polish, against German uh, invasion, and the, the same, uh, the, the the same ideas, the same motives uh, appeared in nineteen in the nineteen forty six referendum, where fear was used as a tool to integrate uh, Poland, to integrate the borderland regions that were uh, short, that, that were joined Poland in nineteen forty five and. Were, were used to to make sure that uh, that Poles who live there and the entire nation will know that these territories need to be guarded, need to be protected, and the, the this main category, this main feeling that was induced into Polish nation at the time was fear. So to sum up, because I can see that uh, thirty minutes have just uh, passed, uh, three main things that I would like to 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 add to the great. Uh, speeches that have so far been uh, delivered during the, the conference. Uh, so uh, I guess this theoretical background that I hope I have provided can serve to, 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 to shed some light to, to border relations and to especially to fear as the one a political category that, um, that constructs borderlands because borderlands are not just borders on lines uh, that demark one nation from another, but first and foremost, in my opinion, these borderlands are uh, social and political and cultural relations uh, that are often uh, led by fear. And even when we look at the, the early 1990s, when this new border, new Polish-German borderland was constructed and created, when after German unification, after democratic changes in Poland, we can see that uh, this uh, in the, in in what Polish politicians said and in what Pol in what in what Polish newspapers and the Polish media said and wrote that this fear 
uh, was still present. That uh, when you look at the documents of uh, of local or national political parties, and when you follow what politicians said and what media communicated, uh, even in 1990s, in the 1990s, when this real Polish-German relations were, were built on totally different uh, paradigm than in the uh, in the night than in earlier than earlier you will see that fear existed that this politics of fear was not used such extensively as it was in 1945 and later during the communist years but even though in the 1990s this politics of fear is still visible and uh, somehow it still constructed the the, the contemporary polish german border than we live in so that's all from me uh if you have any questions i would be happy to try to answer them thank you thank you so much uh professor Wasilewski, uh for your presentation its contents and your time discipline uh, i'm happy also that uh thanks to your presentation uh have the opportunity the opportunity to uh to stress uh, uh, that our conference, of course, is a, a, a conference on uh, historical topics, but it's uh, seen from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective as the problem of emotions in international relations, fear in particular, as I had the opportunity to tell it, to say it yesterday during the introduction to our conference, is something that needs also tools, methods or theoretical approaches not only from history, of course, uh, but also from political science, uh, cultural studies, sociology, uh, and also psychology uh, sometimes, because in, indeed it's about emotions, uh, collective ones, of course. Um, your uh, presentation was uh, very interesting from uh, this uh, very point of view that it was uh, on this theoretical basis, that it was reflecting the, the problem of politics of fear and how fear can be an instrument for domestic policies or international relations in the, let's say, uh, southern Baltic uh, space, the Polish, Polish-German, Polish-Russian one. Uh, we could extend it also to other mm, uh, uh, examples. Um, before I uh, take the chance, uh, I hope to ask you some questions, I uh, wouldn't like to uh, abuse my position as a uh, the organizer. Um, so uh, the uh, floor is uh, for the other participants. We will start now our discussion. You can ask your questions or add your, your comments. You can uh, write them down in the chat window if you are um, a non-panelist. Uh, otherwise, uh, all the other panelists can just uh, switch on their cameras and their microphone and ask their questions. If there are more of, of you, you, maybe it would be nice to use this uh, small blue hand just to uh, signalize that you would like to, to ask something. So, okay, uh, it's your turn. I hope we have some uh, issues here. Okay, so maybe uh, to give the time uh, the other participants, panelists, and maybe also the audience uh, for uh, making their point, uh, I uh, would like to uh, stress the point also that, uh, in fact, the processes we have uh, been able, uh, were able to observe, and you have also described during this uh, uh, referendas and so on, uh, largely seen the, the problem of uh, fear management or the, 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 the boosting of, of existing fears for political use in borderlands. It is something that is also related to existing fears, also from the side of the mm, political decision makers, of course, who are part of society, who, uh, as I, I stressed this yesterday during the introduction, are both uh, fueling emotions, but are also driven by emotions. So that's the difficult part to make the difference about how they are active or how they are also driven by the same emotions. And uh, we have some similar uh, examples. In this uh, case, we see that the Baltic Sea region 
with all, all its specificities, has some common points with other parts uh, with similar problems as far as the relation to Germans or German minorities are concerned, for example. If we have a look farther south in the Central uh, uh, European uh, area, if we have a look at what was happening uh, just after 45 in Czechoslovakia and uh, how the in domestic policy uh, and the demographic uh, politics about uh, the remaining German minority after 45 was organized in, in the Czechoslovakian uh, government, uh, we, we see these this fears. The, first, we had uh, the, the, this, at, uh, this, this step called Otsun, so uh, expulsion, in fact, of this uh, of, of, of the main part of the German minority of the Sudets. Uh, but then for the remaining ones who were necessary, in fact, as, uh, as uh, qualified workers uh, for mining, for example, as in, in Polish Silesia, for example, or in, in the region of Stettin, in the docks, for example, uh, for these uh, remaining parts of the German uh, minorities, uh, there was a, another technique then called Rospil, Rospil, so uh, to 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 um, diffuse, in fact, uh, not to allow uh, allowed the not to allow the the, the, the the remaining German minority to gather in 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 some kind of uh, concentrated areas in order to uh, avoid uh, forms of irredentism from Germany or in order to uh, well, uh, shortcut the, the possibilities for these remaining Germans to organize uh, to gather and so on. So this uh, Rospil, this uh, diffusing uh, of um, the, the German remaining German minority in, in, in Czechoslovakia was a typical case of uh, of um, border fear of, of fear concerning the border region from the side of of the Czechoslovakian politicians. And it's something that, that uh, in this case, we can also uh, observe, even if it's not called uh, that way, uh, as, a, uh, as a, an, an aim to avoid uh, minorities to get organized, especially in border region, in smaller countries around uh, the Baltic Sea, in the Baltic Sea region, uh, be it in, 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 in Estonia or, or in, in Lithuania, in Latvia, for example, uh, if we take the Russian uh, population, for example. Um, I see that we have a question, a written question. I think Professor Vashlevs can see it, but I will read it for uh, everybody. Uh, it's uh, asked by uh, Mrs. Redepenning, who is a, a, a PhD student of the Herder Institute and who is uh, writing or preparing a work about uh, Stettin, the Stettin area, as far as I, I uh, remember, uh, in the after-war period. Um, so uh, I read the question. Thank you for a very interesting insight. I was wondering if the concept of politics of fear in the case of the recovered territories had mostly an internal effect on the local population or if this political tool also aims for external effects, for example, reaction from the Germans and how these tools deal with the risk of escalation of conflict. Uh, do you want to answer right now, maybe? I'll try. Thank you for this interesting question. Uh, and uh, But first I would like to, to, to say a few words about what uh, Professor Weber said, uh, that this uh, dispersed tactics or this politics, politics of fear uh, was used in the borderlands not only um, against Germans, but uh, we must remember that uh, shortly after 1945, uh, some, um, some numbers of the Ukrainian, uh, of Ukrainians were forcibly moved here to the Western territories and dispersed around all these the territories. And in the, 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 prop, the official propaganda, they were pictured as Ukrainian nationalists who, who, who are responsible for, for mass murders of Poles in the eastern, uh, south, the eastern uh, southern uh, frontiers uh, in the pre-war pre Poland. So we can see that this politics of fear was, had uh, a very extensive scope. It was not only directed against the Germans 
or it did not only set the relate the Polish German relations, but it was also used to set all the relations that uh, were in at the time in the Polish German borderland or in the recovered territories. And going back to to the to the the the, the question, uh, the, 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 this politics uh, of fear that was uh, orchestrated by the the the, the, the Polish government. Mm, was first and foremost it served to 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 to, to manipulate uh, the emotions within the Polish population. Uh, at least I would uh, construct such a thesis now, because uh, it, the Germans uh, were exposed uh, from from the t territories in, since 1945, and and when the the, the Poles came. Their numbers were still the numbers of Germans were still high, but they were uh, they, they they were uh, they were leaving their the their own territories uh, on a daily basis. So so the idea was to 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 make sure that the Poles would fear Germans, uh, not the Germans would fear Poles. Of course, the German the, the German propaganda World War Two propaganda uh, worked. Uh, had done a lot of job to, to make the Germans fear uh, Poles, but that the politics of fear that was orchestrated in 1945 by the Polish government, uh, it would uh, it was directed first and foremost uh, at the Polish population. And of course, if it provoked conflicts, and it did provoke conflicts, not only Polish-German conflicts this on the local scale, and, uh, but, but, but also this Polish-Ukrainian uh, conflicts and other minorities conflicts uh, that that happened at the time it it was all in the interest of the 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 the, the, the polish uh, authorities because the more people feared at the time the easier they were to to be uh, controlled the easier they were to be manipulated and that was the main goal of uh, of the politics of fear of the time to make sure that that the polish german borderland or the, the new the recovered territories were were a place where fear uh, played the, 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 one of the the main roles because fear made sh uh, fear uh, made sure using fear it made sure that the the, the, the population that lived there the Polish population that lived there uh, would, would would look at the, the the Polish state as its protector and uh, as its guardian so uh, that was the main uh, point in my opinion at least. I hope I answered the question. Thank you so much. Um, I have a look now at the uh, other panelists. I cannot see any blue hand. So uh, I suppose that there are no questions, no comments by now from our panelists. I checked the um, chat. Uh, I will go ahead, maybe, if I may, uh, uh, looking at what uh, Mrs. Redepenning asked. Uh, in fact, uh, what, what we can observe uh, uh, is that um, as far as uh, the fear of Germans and of Germany uh, was um, something that uh, some political uh, regimes in uh, the region worked with for domestic reasons uh, of course uh, building on existing fears that were uh, quite logical after world war ii uh, in society uh, there was a reaction in some way also on the german part in the german states for example in in the federal republic of germany as in fact uh, we can see that part uh, of the difficulty is to to say which part and it's maybe uh, rather difficult to, to have a, a quantitative approach to it. It was a qualitative one, but part of the, the fact that uh, West uh, German policies would be in some way, mm, uh, well, uh, let's say um, prudent, cautious about some decisions uh, concerning um, Central and Eastern Europe, or uh, maybe they became more cautious than they used to be at the beginning was maybe some form of uh, learning of the reactions that some discourses can uh, um, uh, create uh, uh, at the uh, partner's part. For example, 
if we had very, mm, not say aggressive, but very uh, assertive discourses in West Germany or discourses that would uh, assert uh, still the right of the Germans uh, to the territories they had last lost in, in uh, then Western Poland, so the so-called recovered territories from Polish point of view, uh, Germans learned that, that this kind of discourse would automatically be uh, harmful to uh, West German foreign policy because there would be strong reactions from the Eastern Bloc, not only from Poland, but it would be, of course, uh, with the, the, the approval and with the, 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 the back uh, ground of the Soviet Union too, to say, oh, see, like uh, West Germany is a revisionist power, um, they, are, they, they want to take back what they lost and they lost it because uh, they are responsible for war, so it's not the right position. So in, in at the beginning, the first years of the Bundesrepublik, the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, this was uh, the, the learning process was maybe not that advanced. But as we see how uh, cautiously later, uh, starting with the uh, new uh, Ostpolitik uh, of the SPD, of Willy Brandt, and the next year, uh, how more cautiously uh, West Germany would approach the question of these lost territories, the recognition of the border, and so on. Uh, it, it is not an abuse to say that for some uh, part, it is uh, the result of a certain learning process, how to handle the fears of the others. Being conscious, of course, that fear was an instrument of uh, internal domestic power politics, for example, by the Polish uh, communist regime uh, or others, but still, uh, the effect on society uh, was to be observed. And if West Germany wanted to uh, disconstruct uh, the um, propaganda picture, the picture that was depicted in the, in the communist propaganda about West Germany, and wanted to uh, be able for uh, the populations, as far as they had uh, some access to other information, of course, through uh, uh, Stanislav and so on in later years, to see that West Germany was not necessarily the country, the state that propaganda would uh, describe. So uh, if they would uh, like to change their image also in Eastern Europe, they had to take into account, to keep in mind, which collective emotions could be uh, strengthened or uh, evoked by forms of discourse that would be interpreted as aggressive or uh, forms of irredentism, uh, border revisionism too. Uh, this is more a, a, a comment on, on my part. I, I'm not. I don't know if you agree. Maybe you could uh, um, react to this if, if you want. Of course. Then I see that we have a question or a comment by uh, Dr. Segelke. Uh, but uh, okay, you, you choose if you want to wait for uh, Dr. Segelke. Uh, I'll, I'll wait. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Segelke, it's it's your turn. Thank you. It took, just took me some time to find the little yellow hand uh, that was the, the but um, let's, I would uh, ask something uh, to, to, to 1920s. Uh, so if you would like to answer um, Professor Weber's comment first, um, that's fine with me. Or reply to it. Not, well, it's not really a question for it. It's just I would be yeah, I would be uh, curious if, if you see it this way or, or different, it could be interesting. But if you want to answer first the uh, Dr. Siegelke's uh, and, uh, question, it's, it's not a problem. We have also time during the final discussion when we go back to some some topics. So tomorrow. So, so I will wait for the question and then just reply to, to, to okay. everything. It's, it's a very short question. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was great, inspiring. Uh, um, the presentation. I was wondering whether in 19, to which degree this um, politics of fear were connected with the idea of forcing people of making a decision, of uh, adopting a certain concept of nationality, especially in a border region where it's often multi ethnic, multicultural, and at least in the Danish German case, I think this. In the 1920s, uh, was uh, one main issue to make people accept a certain concept or subscribe to a certain concept of nationality and just 
yeah, just force them into a group. Uh, how was this in, in the uh, the case in the in the Polish uh, German German Polish um, uh, plebiscite in Slesia in the 1920s, where there also a lot of was there the notion that there were a lot of undecided people who would not subscribe to either being Polish or German, and uh, did this play a role? This idea of maybe forcing people to into accepting subscribing to certain concepts of nationality that uh, are connected to certain politics. Thank you for, for such an interesting question. And uh, yeah, I, I have in my uh, speech I forgot to, to mention this. Thank you for reminding uh, about this idea of nationality, nationalisms, and uh, of ethnic struggles that were reborn in the early 20th century. Because as you observed, the, the borderland regions uh, were multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious. And so, in fact, in the 1920s, in the 1920s, and not only in the plebiscite that I talk about, but also in the Silesia plebiscite that you mentioned, some people uh, first heard that there are Germans or Poles. Uh, there, there, there were numbers of people who did not um, think about themselves as uh, members of this nation or, the, or or that nation, especially in the the, the, the Polish Eastern territories that that were uh, inhabited by a number of various groups that spoke their own language that could, that was a mixture of, for example, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, and, and so on. So, uh, so in order to, in order uh, to politics of fear to work and to, to, to achieve its goal, first uh, nation states or national authorities, they had to Create this uh, ethnical identity or this national identity, uh, because yeah, many people it was uh, new for them to 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 see that they have some nationality that, that they lived, their, their families had lived in that territories for for many years or centuries even, and they had never thought about uh, being uh, a member of this or that nation. They lived in either in the Kingdom of Poland or in Prussia. But they, they, they never consider themselves as members of one nation. They, they were simply um, uh, inhabitants of, of given territory. And the politics of fear uh, stimulated the, 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 or enhanced this, uh, the, the, the idea of nationalism within borderland regions. So this, uh, this is what I tried to say through, to, through setting this theoretical context in uh, post-colonial studies, because uh, this nationalisms and uh, division into ethnic ethnical groups was was an idea from the political center, not from peripheries. Mm, uh, and, and politics of fear enhanced the idea that that that, 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 uh, that people were from different nations because uh, nation states had to needed a category through which they could divide through which they could design uh, their border their, their borders the border lines and so on so so nationalism was a, a, a very um, plausible idea to 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 enhance fear because when people were told that they should fear others because they speak a different language or maybe they 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 uh, have, have different religion and then they they, they started to 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 fear them uh but but yeah to, going back to your question this nationalism the, the fact that the, the world war one uh, made nationalism one of the, the the main force in european politics especially in the border and borderland regions not only in poland but as you said in the german danish or in other borders that, that they were set through nationalism scope and perspective uh, then, then I, it's it becomes obvious that politics of fear and uh, nationalism they are interconnected and cannot work one without another. And um, we we could uh, the, how how strong the, this connection is. Uh, we we can observe in this uh, plebiscites that took place after World War One and in what happened after World War Two when new borderlands had to be constructed but but we can also see it now in nowadays like in 2000 
2015 in this refugee crisis when politics of fear was uh, established again and, and when emo people's emotions were manipulated and orchestrated by fear and their political decisions were were, were caused by fear so so it shows that regardless uh, of years and de decades and uh, uh, and historical periods that politics of fear has uh, is one of those political categories that set intercultural relations in a certain context and, and it provokes conflicts and and it sets clear boundaries between us and them and th this is why politics of fear and this is why fear is this category that is in my opinion, crucial to, to for borderland uh, studies and for borderlands as such. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, just have a look. We don't see any other blue hands. If someone about the panelists would like to uh, ask something, not finding, not having found the, the, the blue hand, it's not a problem. Just switch on camera and microphone and ask. Um, if if there is no question from uh, the panelists, uh, I just have a look here. Uh, I, I cannot see any other questions or uh, comments from the mm, audience, from the non-panelists in the chat window. Uh, do you want to mm, make some comment on my comment, or you keep it for later? As far as uh, the possible. German learning process with the handling of uh, others' emotions with regards to Germany is concerned. It's kind of... Uh, well, I would Ooh. agree with you on most uh, things that you said, so... Okay. I, would not like, I don't want to repeat the, the, what you said, but, but yeah, I, I think you're right in what you said about uh, fear and emotions from the German side. It, it, it's what sometimes uh, we can call, uh, I'd say, uh, well, maybe it's, it's a kind of a stylistic game, but uh, fear of the fear. In fact, uh, you, you want to, to be careful with what you're saying because you know that if you say too much or if you don't say it the way you should or the way they expect it, at least in order to be not uh, threatful, you will uh, create some additional fears or stir existing ones. Uh, which, in fact, uh, can be seen from the Polish perspective in the German-Polish relations as quite, we could say, uh, the strength of uh, of the weaker, because uh, there is a form of control uh, thanks to uh, what uh, you could say the emotional uh, dimension of the relation. Uh, at least in 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 the times where there was a very strong um, political manipulation, of course, of of collective, of existing collective emotions uh, in the Polish society with regard to to Germany and, and the Germans. Uh, of course, making it different between the good East Germans, the communist one, and the and the and the bad West German, the capitalist one. But that that's another point of of, of state propaganda, of course. We, we can see that the same cliches are used even now, not on such a large scale. And the fear is not that. That great that was orchestrated in 1940s, for example. But as I said, even in uh, the early 1990s, when Polish-German relations were uh, set on totally different categories, when when there were uh, when we wanted friendly relations from both sides, even then the, 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 the fear of, of Germans coming back to their old territories was visible even in official uh, political, even in official uh, speeches by politicians or in the media that that, that, that somehow used this this fear of, of the Germans uh, to, 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 to create, to, to, to set new relations in the borderland. And we can uh, still see it when, when, when the, the fear of Foreigners, when the fear of others is still used, not just in border relations, uh, but in a far much larger context. And not just in Poland, but in other countries as well. Yes, of course, uh, not just in Poland, that, that for sure. Uh, just because uh, through your, your presentation, we had a 
uh, more specific look on, let's say, the, the southern shore of our uh, Baltic Sea area, of course, but we have, uh, and we, we will have uh, many other possibilities, opportunities during our conference also to, to have a look to compare with other, other shores of the Baltic Sea. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Vasilevsky for your uh, very, very interesting input, uh, also theoretical input uh, into uh, our conference, uh, conference topics. Uh, we uh, duly ended the first part of uh, today's uh, morning presentations. It's uh, half past 10. And uh, I propose that, uh, of course, the best thing would be to stay in the room. You can just switch off your camera, switch off your microphone, but it's not necessary to log out and log in. Uh, it's just for 15 minutes just to, to have your, your eyes and legs uh, rest a bit uh, after sitting in front of your, your um, uh, screen. So we'll meet at 10.45, okay? for the next presentation by Dr. German uh, Ragozin from Arkhangelsk, far in the north. Uh, thank you very much and see you soon in a quarter of hour.